are you, Iowa? Hey, it is great to see you guys here tonight. And uh, there's a whole lot of other people who were trying to get in, but we hit capacity. Capacity is exactly what you want to hit the week before the Iowa caucuses, isn't it? So look, I want to thank you. I want to thank the people of Iowa. I love your state. I love the beauty of your landscape. I love the warmth of your people. And I love this most of all. I love the fact that in Iowa, you're not intimidated by polls. You're not intimidated by big money. You're not intimidated by the big banks. And on caucus night, you always have a way of upsetting the apple cart, don't you? And with three of us in this Democratic Party, there's only one of us who can still upset the apple cart. <laughs> so look, I need your help. Uh, this is not an ordinary time in our country's history. When the leader of the Republican uh, Party, uh, when they're, the guy who's in the forefront of the Republican Party is a man who makes increasingly more racist, fascist appeals, who says outrageous things like if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, his poll numbers still wouldn't go down. This should tell all of us, this should tell all of us that this is no ordinary campaign year. And we're not going to beat the, the anger, the meanness, the fear, and the loathing by answering in kind. No. Instead, we're going to speak to the goodness within our country. We're going to speak to the attitudes, especially of young Americans under 30, who understand. Because I've now traveled all over this country of yours, and you will rarely find among young people under 30, young Americans who think that climate change isn't real. You'll rarely find young Americans that want to slam America's door in the face of, of refugees fleeing genocide. And you'll rarely find among young people those that want to bash new American immigrants or deny rights to gay couples or their kids. So. So all of this tells me we're actually moving to a much more connected, a much more generous, and a much more compassionate place. And you have the opportunity here, Iowa, to do that which you do best. Because I didn't come here to praise you. I came here to challenge you. I've challenged you to lift up a new leader. You've done it before. You did it eight years ago. And our country is the better for it. Eight years ago, our nation was this close to being plunged into a second Great Depression because of recklessness and greed on Wall Street. And you brought forward a new leader in Barack Obama. And now our country is doing better. Two years in a row of the best job growth we've had since the 1990s because of Barack Obama. And now we need to build on the good things he's done to make wages go up again for all Americans. Because the hard truth of our times is this. While our country is doing better, 70% of us are earning the same or less than we were 12 years ago. And nothing works very well for long in the United States unless people who work hard are able to get ahead and give their kids a better future. There is in our nation a growing injustice, a growing income inequality, a growing opportunity gap, and that sort of injustice doesn't solve itself. It requires us together, and it requires new leadership. Look, my story is not the story of a democratic conversion. It is the story of a democratic upbringing. I was born the year that President Kennedy was killed. My parents taught us to love our country, to love God, to love our family, and to understand that the stronger we make our country, the more she can give back to us, to our children, and to our grandchildren. And the experience that I have to offer you in this race it's not the experience of, of a senator or a congressperson. I have not been part of the gridlocked national politics that has been our country's uh, recent past. My experience is as a mayor and as a governor, bringing people together, getting things done, raising the uh, minimum wage, passing a living wage, uh, making it easier for people to vote instead of harder. And unlike Governor Branstead, Instead of cutting public education, we increased education funding by 37% and made our schools number one. And we did some other radical crazy things too. We went four years in a row without a pennies increase to college tuition. We made it, we made it easier for people to vote instead of harder for people to vote. 
We passed marriage equality. We passed the DREAM Act. And when all of those kids were slaughtered in that Connecticut classroom, I brought my state together to pass comprehensive gun safety legislation with a ban on combat assault weapons sales. And by taking action to include more people more fully in the economic, social, and political life that we shared as a state, we also defended the highest median income all through the recession, a better rate of job creation. I'll be darned. That old notion our parents and grandparents had of including more people more fully is actually good economics. Because the truth of our matter is this. Our economy is not money, it's people. It's all of our people. And if we're going to bring our nation together, if we're going to make wages go in the right direction, we have to start acting according to that formula of success that earned us the brand of the land of opportunity. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about three things primarily. To make ourselves stronger at home. And in the Q&A, let's talk about a, new, a need for a new foreign policy of engagement and collaboration, a new national security strategy of threat reduction. But make no mistake about it, all of those things depend on our making ourselves stronger at home. And this is how we do it by restoring common sense wage and labor policies that actually allow people to earn more as they, as they work hard. In other words, uh, things like, I say that we should raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, however we can, wherever we can. We should pay overtime pay for overtime work. And we should make real the long deferred promise of equal pay for equal work for men and women. And if we want wages to go up rather than down, why would we consign all of our seniors to retire into a life of poverty rather than an, uh, a life of a retirement of dignity? We shouldn't scrap Social Security, no. We need to expand Social Security, and I put forward a plan to do that and increase average benefits. If we want to get wages to go up rather than down, let's get 11 million of our neighbors out of the underground shadow economy by passing comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship for our people. <laughs> Secondly, no nation ever built up generational prosperity and gave their kids a better future by locking cash in a closet. We are Americans. We make investments that pay a dividend and a return over the generations. What are some of those things? The investments we make in research and development, hum, uh, human uh, solutions to human problems, infrastructure, transportation, the water and wastewater infrastructure that connects us to the other living systems of this earth. And we also make investments in every generation to educate our children at higher and better levels, right? Look, my dad went to college on a GI Bill. He flew 33 missions over Japan, and because of a far-seeing and generous nation, he was able to go to college. My daughters went to college on a mountain of bills. <laughs> Their mother and I were very proud of them on graduation day, and we're going to be proud every month for the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> you got to laugh because it hurts too much to cry. <laughs> but it doesn't need to be this way. And that is why among the 15 strategic goals I've laid out to move our country forward and restore the truth of the American dream that we share, one of those goals is, to, is the plan I have put forward to create a debt-free college option again for all American families. <laughs> Finally, and then let's do some Q&A, because you're not really in Iowa unless you're doing question and answer on a chair at caucus time. Uh, finally, the great challenge of our times. You know, there has never been a group of human beings on the planet that ever assembled themselves together, formed a republic that were more innovative, that were more creative, that had a genius for harnessing the diversity, which is their great strength to solve their problems, than us. U period, S period. And one of the great challenges on our horizon, there are many, changing nature of conflict and, and the threat that it poses, but another great challenge is climate change. The greatest business opportunity to come to the United States of America in 100 years. And look, Iowa, 
how you're pointing the way forward on this as well. 30 to 35% of your energy now comes from clean Iowa wind. And it wasn't there just 15 years ago. And that's without your national government even breaking a sweat. You employ 5,000 people in a new wind industry. And you know what the great thing is about those big component parts you see rumbling down I-80 and other highways? They're too damn big for it to make any sense to import them from China. So most of them have to get built here. This is the circulatory in more ways than one, clean, green economy, where by squaring our shoulders to the challenge of our times, we make it our opportunity. We create jobs. We, we build what we need here. And that's why I am the first candidate. Let's hope not the last. There's still five days before caucus time. But I'm the first candidate to put forward a plan to move us to a 100% clean, green, electric grid and create 5 million jobs along the way. These are the ambitions that are worthy of a truly great people. And we are a truly great people. Some of the others that I put forward, things like making national service an option for every kid in America so that they can earn additional Pell Grant, uh, 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 grants and be able to give back to their country in public service in some way, public health, environmental restoration, eradicating Childhood hunger in the next five years. No child in our country should go to bed and wake up every single night and day hungry. We have the ability to cut gun deaths in half in our country. We're the only nation on the planet that has this problem. And it won't go away by pretending that we don't have it. We have the ability to cut in half the number of Americans who kill themselves from drug overdose deaths. Look, we are all in this together. We need each other. And we have to help each other if we're going to succeed. And my plea to you tonight is this, Iowa. Look, there are many people who say to me over the course of these last several weeks, man, you've got a tough fight. I know. <laughs> I got into this knowing it was a tough fight. And the tough fight I'm talking about is the ability, our ability, to be able to give our kids a future with more health, more security, and more prosperity. That's the tough fight that I have volunteered for. And I have always been up. I have always been drawn to a tough fight. And you know what? I think you are too. I believe the toughness of the fight is the way the hidden God has of telling us we're actually fighting for something worth saving. I didn't run for mayor of Baltimore in 1999 because I thought it was easy. I didn't run because we were doing well. I didn't lay my state through easy times, I led my state through a recession. And what we need to do now is lead our country through what is some of the uh, most divided times that our politics has faced in a long time. But there is nothing so divided about our nation's politics that it can't be healed with a renewed faith in one another, with new leadership. So I ask you, go to your caucus on Monday night. And when you and your neighbors are determining who can best bring us together, of the three of us, who has the best chance to pull our country together, win this general election, build on the good things that President Obama has done? I want you to hold strong in that first alignment. When people split into their corners, I want you to hold strong, not just for me. I want you to hold strong for that country you carry in your heart. Because there's a lot of forces that have tried to tell you what the outcome is going to be before caucus night. They'd like you to believe that there's only two people in this race and that we've become such an impoverished party that we're a party of either or. So I want you to hold strong. And I want you to hold strong and I want you to think of those kids that are only going to be in third grade once in their life. And I want you to hold strong for them and lift me up to viability in that second realignment. I want you to hold strong for that mom and dad who are working three jobs between them and sweating away over the kitchen table figuring out what bills to pay, I want you to hold strong for them. I want you to hold strong for those senior citizens who have given their all for this country and wonder if they're going to have to choose between their food and their medicine. We are a good people. We are a compassionate people. We are a generous people. And we must hold strong to the values that make us Americans. That's what this race is about. That's what each of you have the power to do. And that's what we're going to do when together we hold strong on caucus night and shift the dynamic of this race and point America to the better future that we carry in our hearts. 
Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, guys. Whew. I wish I brought my phone in to take a picture of you guys from up here. Somebody give me a cell phone and I'll give you my... Uh, uh, you'll send it to me? Okay, everybody wave. Good. Okay, everybody this way. Wave. Okay, hold on. One more. Hold on, wait a minute. All right. Everybody fists in the air. Hold strong. Woo! All right. Tweet away, my man. All right. <laughs> Questions, answers. And if you have answers, raise your hand first. Yes, sir. I was wondering. And then we'll go to you. National debt. I'll repeat the question. Do you believe that we could do a value-added tax like Sweden, uh, Japan, and three other countries do on imports? If we did that and claim that simply for debt retirement, that would sort of take away the fire we hear from the other side. Yeah. So here's the question. The question up here is about the national debt. And the gentleman not only asks the question, he offers an answer. And the answer is, uh, what about having a value-added uh, tax that we apply to imports in order to retire the debt? I don't know that I'm ready to endorse that answer, but uh, I encourage all of us to come with answers to the table of democracy. This is how I believe that we need to bring down our debt. Uh, our debt is driven primarily by the fact that we were led falsely into war in Iraq by George Bush. And that is the biggest driver of our debt. Um, so we're going to have to bring it down. Uh, the best way to do that is to make our economy grow. But there's another, there's an entitlement we can no longer afford as a nation. And that is the entitlement that the super wealthy among us, those who make more than a million dollars, feel that they're entitled to pay a lower effective tax rate than middle-class Americans. We can't afford that anymore. If we did just two things, raise the highest marginal rate on people making more than a million dollars to 45%, and tax capital gains at the same rate that we tax work, our, our earnings from hard work and sweat and toil, toil, that would generate $800 billion, and that could go a long way to paying down the debt, as well as paying for debt-free college again, as well as making the investments that make our economy grow. Yes, ma'am, in the glasses. Yes. The, 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 the question was about PEPFAR funding. Look, uh, let's talk a little broader about being uh, what I mean when I say we need a new foreign policy of engagement and collaboration with people around the world. There are better ways for America to lead in this world, to collaborate in this world, and to bolster our own security here at home than simply by grabbing for military tools or thinking that we have a mission to go roaming the world to tip over dictators. There are many threats to humanity. AIDS is one of them. Ebola out of Africa is another. And we need what General Martin Dempsey called a whole of government approach to these sorts of threats. Uh, and so I intend as president to make for the first time the director of USAID a direct presidential report. On, and uh, I intend to dial up sustainable development along with diplomacy so that we can actually lead in this world because we have to forge new alliances uh, uh, in Africa and in other places that are more nimble, more adaptive, better at seeing threats as they're rising, and then taking the actions to mitigate them. Uh, our, our role in the world is to lead by example the cause of a rising global middle class. We do that primarily here, but there are, for all the talk about weapons of mass destruction that got us into that last war, we need to unleash the American weapons of mass salvation, the cures, the compassion, the American hands in the Peace Corps and other places that can heal this world of ours. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go kind of circular around the room and I'm gonna be shorter in my answers so we get more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, 
<laughs> the question was, uh, after being elected president, would I, would I consider Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton for cabinet positions? Uh, sure. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, my stance on fracking is this. Uh, we never had fracking in my state of Maryland. Uh, in fact, on what the governor following me, I put out what are still regarded as the highest uh, regulations protecting air quality, water quality, and human health that have ever been promulgated out there. Uh, the new governor pulled them right back, but the fact remains we don't have fracking in our state, and I have advanced as part of my climate change plan that we should have a zero tolerance for methane release in the fracking process. People like to talk about how natural gas burns cleaner than coal, but you can do just as much damage in the extraction process if you allow the methane to escape. So I believe that our future is going to be found not by new ways to burn more fossil fuels. Some of that stuff's going to have to stay in the ground. We didn't leave the Stone Age behind us because we ran out of rocks. So, so, we, need, so we need to extend the renewable tax credits for solar and for wind, not just five years, but 15 or 20 years. We need to make the investments in new battery technology and next generation safer nuclear as all of these nuke plants start to come offline and with, by the way, a whole lot of waste behind them. And we need to see the new era of buildings, our built environment, that net zero homes, uh, way beyond lead, buildings and then the human footprint that produces more energy than it consumes. And we need to use our cities as the leading edge in that process. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, the question in the back is about the, this shameful move that we have going on in our country to for-profit prisons. And did you know that our country now maintains the largest system of immigrant detention camps of any nation on the planet? Uh, I, I am uh, totally opposed to uh, for-profit prisons, uh, and I would seek to get us out of those contracts. <laughs> Jorge Ramos has called my comprehensive immigration reform plan the most uh, progressive and comprehensive of any candidate running for president. And part of that is that I want to shut down these shameful numbers of immigrant detention camps uh, that are penning up women and children and families for months and months and months on end with absolutely no due process and when there's not even a threat to public safety, and also these, these rather mindless deportations that we're doing, breaking up families. All of those things are actions inconsistent with our principles as a people. As, uh, as governor, I drove our incarceration rate down to 20-year lows at the same time that I drove violent crime down to 30-year lows. There are things that work, that reduce recidivism, that reduce... Uh, uh, I also restored voting rights to 52,000 people, and it took me three tries, but I repealed the death penalty in our state as well. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, in the back. Yes, you. Huh. Yeah, yeah, maybe after I'm president, I wouldn't mind doing giving back to the party. <laughs> but only if my brother weren't willing to do it. The, the, uh, look, I, th this is, uh, I believe we would be much better served as a country if uh, the Democratic Party, instead of its leadership, current leadership, spending so much energy to uh, limit debates and then to hide them on uh, Sunday or Saturday nights when fewest people will watch them, that we would be much better served as a country <laughs> if instead we had a 50-state strategy to pass two important constitutional amendments. One would be to enshrine in the Constitution the right to vote. The 
And I know it's hard. And I know you have to go state by state. But you can't win elections at any level of government if you stop organizing as a party. I mean, uh, if, the other constitutional amendment would be to overturn Citizens United. <laughs> Can you just imagine the debates in Des Moines on the, in your state house? Those would be fun ones to have. When we ask people in the other party, well, why are you voting against a constitutional amendment that would enshrine the right to vote? Why are you voting against a constitutional amendment that says that corporations are not people? I'd like to have those conversations <laughs> in 50 states. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have two questions. What would be your, some of your specifics of your plan to improve the Social Security and Medicare issues that are occurring now for seniors? And then also, how, what specifics do you have in your plan to improve things for current military and veterans? Okay, the question in the back is about Social Security, Medicare, and veterans. Hoorah. <laughs> so uh, let me begin with Social Security. I put out a, a proposal, a plan about two months ago, or was it three, that would raise uh, average benefits by $65 uh, for uh, uh, Social Security, uh, that would scrap the cap on incomes above $250,000. So once you're at $250,000, you start paying back yum. And that's on Social Security. Also related, Social Security is a caregiver tax credit. We disproportionately punish as a nation uh, a lot of women who drop out of the, uh, the workforce in order to raise family or take care of, of parents. And so I'm seeking to create a, uh, I plan to uh, create a uh, caregiver credit uh, so that we, we stop doing that. Um, Let me touch on Medicare uh, very briefly and then uh, veterans. On Medicare, our state has what we call an all-payer system. We have a rate-setting commission that sets the rates that hospitals are able to charge. And uh, we have now moved, thanks to the Affordable Care Act and a waiver from Medicare, we've moved all 46 of our acute care hospitals out of fee-for-service, and we pay them a global payment for all of their Medicare and Medicaid patients, and they're able to share in the savings if they reduce hospital readmissions and keep people well and better coordinate their care. And the New England Journal of Medicine did an article four weeks ago, and they said, I'll be damned. It actually works. So we saved $110 million for Medicare. Uh, we've had a lot of debates about who picks up the tab for rising health care costs, but the better question is, what are we paying for? You know, are we, should we keep paying hospitals like their hotels? The more sick bed nights they fill up, the more profitable they are? Or should we put wellness at the center and actually pay to improve wellness? I vote for the wellness. And and, and finally on the veterans, uh, one of the things that I have, uh, one of the things I've learned about, uh, I'm trying to come up with a shorter way to say this. When our veterans come home, there is absolutely no handoff between the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs or even your state offices of Veterans Affairs. On the DD-214 that uh, you veterans fill out when you come home and you're discharged, there's not even a box on there for a, an email address. And a lot of our veterans get lost and, uh, and they become ghost people. We catch up with them in hospitals. We catch up with them in county jails. But one of the 15 strategic goals I've set for our nation is full employment for our veterans, which means we have to start engaging them on an employment conversation basis long before they're discharged from the Department of Defense and make sure those connections are there using modern technology, GIS, customer service, all of those sorts of things that will identify choke points in services, but also keep our veterans from becoming anonymous numbers that somehow fall off our grid and get lost in in jails or morgues or their own despair. Yes, sir, gun sense voter. That's pretty clever, bringing a sign. <laughs> You're a mom demanding action. I want to thank you for your knowledge and insights. Um, as a mom, I'm thinking that you're a good guy. I want to know if you're elected president, what would be your first 19 priorities? Yeah, look, the, I've, we, I should say, have been driving the debate in our party. 
There's other fellows I don't think even talk about this issue on their, on their stage. And uh, of the three of us running, uh, one of us has been remarkably consistent through all the years on this issue, <laughs> and that person is me. And I think you need to, and uh, uh, with great respect for my other two colleagues. Uh, the, uh, so I intend to be relentless in pursuing comprehensive gun safety legislation, reinstating the ban on combat assault weapons like we used to have in this country. <laughs> And requiring universal background checks. 90% of independents, Democrats, and Republicans agree we should have universal background checks. When uh, ISIL is doing YouTube videos telling their members the best way to avoid a background check is by going to a gun show to buy your combat assault weapon, that should tell us, without need of a homeland security expert, that we have a vulnerability to close. And I also put out about seven executive actions the president can take. Uh, in fact, President Obama is taking up a couple of these. Uh, we're, the largest, uh, uh, we're the largest purchaser of guns in the United States. This is the United States government itself. If we use that procurement power to insist on highest and best safety technology, uh, you know, the, the uh, micro-stamping of rounds, the uh, serial numbers that can't be effaced. Uh, another one is Congress voted overwhelmingly to take uh, guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. And yet the follow-up with that on the local, with local law enforcement is next to nothing. That can be addressed through executive action. There are about two million people who are turned away because they fail their background checks. But the follow-up there is, is next to nothing, and that can be fixed. We gotta get local law enforcement, state law enforcement, and we have to not be intimidated by the NRA. The NRA can't t should not be able to tell law enforcement they can't share information. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you've been very patient. You thought I wasn't coming back your way. I, I got that. Um, Governor Lally, last week, Marco Rubio put out something, Senator Marco Rubio put out something that, you know, he's been telling for a while, which is making it easier for students of any kind uh, to go to private schools rather than their public schools. Now, my question is, if someone came up through public school and loved my public school, is why do we give the option to go to private school when public schools could be damn well better than private schools Yeah, the question up front here was about uh, private school vouchers, I think, uh, in, in essence, and why can't we improve our public schools? The, I've, I've never been totally, uh, I've never been rigid about this. We had a number of charters. The ones that worked, we tried to learn from them. The ones that didn't work, we had to shut down. Uh, but I always saw my primary job as making our public school system overall better. So that's where I put my energies, and I treated... And a, and a key ingredient that allowed that to happen is we treated our teachers as the professionals they are, with dignity and respect, and we listened to them. We created, we created a survey instrument that we did every two years so that we would learn about what's going on in the learning environment. What's the leadership like in a particular school? How is this new curriculum being implemented? Is it working? What are the things we can do differently? We, we made our public schools the best in America five years in a row. We didn't do it by doing less for them or vilifying our teachers. Uh, but uh, once you create that atmosphere, and one of the goals I have is to increase college and career readiness in our country's uh, public schools. I have found that when you set goals with deadlines, uh, that really smart, and you treat people with dignity and respect, and you lift up the leaders, that uh, the people figure out how to do what works to drive towards goal. And our teachers really led the way. You know, in our state, and let me brag a second here, more of our kids take and pass AP-related STEM courses than any other state in the country. And I'd like to say that we had a great training program for the teachers, but you know what? We didn't, but when they knew that was the goal, they went and found ways to improve their own ability to, uh, to teach these subjects. And so, uh, anyway, uh, I think there's exciting things we can on our horizon. Universal pre-K, reinstilling music, art, experiential learning, conceptual learning in our schools. Reforming the fourth year of high school so that all of our kids get a, not only a, a high school uh, diploma that means something, but a year or a half a year of college credit that can transfer up and a skill in a, a certificate in a skill that's actually demand, in demand in today's economy rather than our grandparents' economy. Yes, sir, in the white t-shirt. Yes, sir.
Mm. We've talked about facing the ISIS threat in Syria. You've talked about opposing terrorist threats. What about the threat that our country is putting towards hospitals? Coalition forces have bombed six different hospitals in the Middle East. All of them clearly designed, all of them with the crosses on the, on the top of the roof, all of them broadcasting their locations, their attacks. What are you going to do? I don't care what you're going to do as president. I, I care about what you're going to do right now. You have the national viewpoint. You are in the media right now. What are you going to do about that? Yeah, the war is uh, awful things happen in war, man. Uh, and I appreciate you speaking up and sharing with all of us uh, uh, that, that reality and that truth. Uh, and, and so look, uh, I'm one human being out here in, in this race. I'm trying to learn every single day. And I'm in this race for one reason and one reason only. And I'm going to continue to speak truthfully and I'm going to continue to speak fearlessly, even about the uncomfortable and the ugly truths out there that we need to face as a people. This is a really messed up and imperfect world we're in right now. This, this evil that we combat over there is a genocidal evil. And uh, we need to do a much better job of, uh, of uh, deconflicting and recognizing uh, these sorts of sites and, and limiting this collateral damage that can uh, sadly uh, uh, proliferate when we start treating war like a push button exercise. And so, uh, so look, ma'am, I appreciate you saying and giving voice to all of those souls. Yeah. And thank you. Yes, ma'am. How are we doing on time? Because I don't want to. Okay. Because I want to come out there and talk with you too, rather than. Access to mental health care. As access, I think we need to get the. I think we need to create a, a block grant program for states to keep their skin in the game. Sadly, health care, the availability of mental health care, varies according to how committed your governor is or is not to it. Uh, yeah. I can tell you that I learned uh, as mayor of Baltimore that if you try to treat addiction without also treating mental health and the physical health of a person, you're playing whack-a-mole. I mean, you're just going to you're going to spend a lot of money doing the addiction treatment again and again and again and they just kind of flip. So, you got to treat the whole person. As as governor, I increased access to public I increased public mental health access by 80% as governor uh, by investing more. Yes, sir. Let's go lightning round. We'll go like zip, zip, zip. Okay, so you were talking about how China has a good strategy with solar energy and you want to increase manufacturing in our country. What are some other things that we'll do to help get our country to 50% clean energy by 2020? Yeah, I outlined a few of them. Uh, we need to extend the investor tax credits for uh, solar and wind, like 15 or 20 years. We need to regionalize this approach. We need to lift up the, uh, in other words, off the, coast of, off the East Coast, there's a lot of offshore wind that could be harnessed. There's a role for the federal government to play in financing the vertebrate offshore that would allow us to actually get that wind onshore. In the Southwest, there's a need to get solar from the Southwest deserts and get that to those populations. And then here in the Midwest, to get wind to, to, uh, uh, to Chicago and, and other places. Uh, there's also uh, a, a need for, I believe, a whole new generation of clean, green buildings that actually produce more energy than they use. There are best practices that many states have engaged in. In the back, the question was more specifics on the green energy. Um, there are many of us, my state was one of them, that actually engaged in a regional cap and trade. And it works. And then we take those proceeds and invest it in more renewables. And, and uh, uh, there are also states who have decoupled the consumption motive from uh, their utilities so that uh, utilities can actually be profitable by maintaining a dynamic grid instead of by how much fossil fuel they burn and how much energy they get everybody to use. So it's those best practices that need to be lifted up. And we also need to bring our best scientists together and invest in accelerating battery technology, the storage capacity for some of these intermittent uh, renewables. And we also need to pick a winner when it comes to how we replace all the BTUs we're about to lose from uh, nuclear plants that are about to be decommissioned with, oh, by the way, big waste behind them. And there may well be an elegant solution that can be figured out here with pebble bed technology that'll take care of that waste and also replace those BTUs that we're about to use. That was not the short answer I was hoping for. Yes? <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 
situation in Flint, Michigan was the question, being a former mayor. And uh, I can tell you this, uh, that would never have happened in, in my city. Uh, and I ran the water department in my city. And I think the part of the thing that contributed to that happening was the utter disregard for the citizens there when their own government was stripped away from them. And it allowed people to say, talk to the hand, instead of actually talking to citizens who had a franchise and a vote and were taxpayers. Uh, so it's not a light thing to take away a city's ability to govern itself. When cities, because of structural employment and changes in the economy, run into these sorts of uh, bankruptcy issues, I think our federal government needs to step up and not look the other way And when people get disenfranchised. In my own city, we drove down lead poisoning of children by 90% in seven relentless years of follow-up. Um, so this is, this is a, 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 some people have resigned, other people may well go to jail and maybe should. Uh, this is a, a, a negligence that approaches criminal. Yes? Yeah, thank you. Question was about bullying. Mrs. O'Malley, Katie O'Malley, made this one of her main things as a as first lady of Maryland. And uh, we did some really good things in our school system to create better accountability, better openness, instead of trying to suppress these problems, to come up with policies that allow kids to come forward and that allow some redress at the school level. That's something we need to push back on. And uh, we should have zero tolerance for bullying of any sort in our schools. Yes? Do I think the federal government is too big? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think the federal government is too big. I think the federal government, I, mean, I, think, um, I think the federal government still gets a free pass, though, when it comes to actually being able to tell us whether it's producing anything better this week than it was last week. My big innovations in government, I got the Kennedy School Award for this from Harvard. I wasn't trying to be clever. I was just trying to save a dying city. And our big innovation? was we started measuring, instead of just the annual budgetary inputs, how much government costs, we started measuring every day and every two weeks what government actually produced and whether we produced it in a timely and courteous way. So we used geographic information systems. We put 311 on the front end. We opened up the, we used the internet so every citizen could see what our response time was for potholes or, or other things of that nature. And as the leader, I brought people back to the table every two weeks in collaborative circles with them in the center of that emerging truth, asking the question, is what we're doing working any better this week than it was last week? And if not, why not? And how can we change it? And so we would find ourselves sometimes shifting resources from one department to another, sometimes merging functions together in collaborative ways. But no, I don't think that our federal government is too big, but I do think our federal government needs to join the modern age and be able to show us and tell us whether it's doing what it's doing uh, uh, any better than it was two weeks ago. So I did that at the state level. We called it city stat at the... Uh, or rather at the city level, we called it city stat. At the state level, we called it state stat. It's how we helped clean up the streams of the Chesapeake Bay by creating bay stat to monitor the actions we take on land to reduce nitrogen, sediment, and phosphorus flow. And uh, I'm looking forward to bringing fed stat to a White House near you. OK, in the back, you might get the last one. And then I'm, I want to stay and talk with you like we're all human beings, all right? Yes? Thank you. Uh, the, what are my plans? If I'm elected president, what are my plans to combat police brutality? I put forward a new agenda for criminal justice reform that is informed by 23 years of experience. I was a prosecutor for two years right out of law school. I was a defense attorney for eight years while I also served on the Baltimore City Council. And then I ran for mayor the year we sadly allowed ourselves to become the most violent, addicted, and abandoned city in America. And there was never a single day that went by when we did not talk about the painful way that our legacy of racial injustice and slavery is intertwined with law enforcement and criminal justice in our country. But we found things that worked. We tended to that wound every single day, and we made better. Uh, one of the things that we did was we openly started reporting our discourtesy, excessive force, and use of lethal force. And we put it online for everybody to see. 
so that the citizens would know whether we were doing any better this year than we were last year. We did better training. We created an early alert system so that an officer racked up problems. They were pulled off the street so that we could figure out what was going on and we could do the retraining necessary to address that. We started doing 100 reverse integrity stings a year in order to make sure to police the integrity of our force. Uh, uh, an example of a sting that somebody would fail is when they plant drugs on a suspect. You know, you call in a, a, a false report or you call in a fictitious report, they get out and instead plant uh, drugs on a suspect not matching that description. We created a civilian review board, gave them their own detectives to investigate cases. And uh, so those were some of the things that we did. And, uh, and those are things that our whole country should do. We, just like we require all police departments to report their UCR crimes, murder, rape, robbery, and those things, we should require all police departments to report their discourtesy, excessive force, use of lethal force. I drove ours down. Three of the four lowest years of fatal involved police sh shootings were occurred during my, my, you know, were achieved during my time as mayor. And I mentioned before, as governor, we found other things that worked as, as well in criminal justice. Those are in that talk. But your question was about uh, policing and policing the police. We also uh, greatly increased our minority recruitment so that our department reflected the diversity of the people that it served. OK, last one. The marijuana question is the last question before we break for a beer. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you the ins and outs of all of his. I can tell you where I am. As governor, I decriminalized possession of marijuana in my state, and I also created avenues for automatic expungements. I restored voting rights to 52,000 people. 